Well, welcome to the breakout session. Uh, we're glad you're here. My name is Eric, one of the pastors here at Parkside, and uh, we're glad to have Jonathan Holmes here as a fellow colleague from Parkside Green Campus to talk about the topic of sexual identity, hope, and the gospel. And after Jonathan speaks, we'll have a time for Q&A. We have some microphones ro roving around the auditorium. If you just keep the microphone close to your mouth when you speak uh, so we can hear you, uh, that would be great. But let me pray, and then we'll have Jonathan come up. Father, thank you for your grace and goodness and for bringing us all here today. And we just pray that you would help Jonathan as he speaks, that your word would go out and accomplish its purpose in our hearts, Father, and that on this important topic that you would equip us, Lord, to, to minister to the people you've called us to and to love people. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, and uh, welcome to this breakout session on sexual identity, a hope, and the gospel. Uh, if you did not get a handout, uh, we are printing more handouts, and those will be available. And as soon as I see uh, our, our intern and our friend coming with those, I'll make mention of that. Otherwise, you can visit the Basics website at basicsconference.org forward slash handouts, and uh, you can download it there. I'd encourage you to do that. On the final two pages of the handout, uh, there's hundreds of resources there. A lot of them are hyperlinks, so if you had the PDF, you could just click it, and it would take you to the website, uh, and that will keep you from typing in periods and colons and forward slashes to, to try to get to the resource. Uh, when we think about the issue of sexual identity and homosexuality in general, it's a tough topic, right? It is a difficult topic for us to oftentimes know how to navigate and know how to address. And I know in a setting this broad that many of us probably have firsthand experience with it. It might be a family member who has recently come out. It might be an extended family member, somebody in your church and in your congregation. Uh, I'll make a little bit of an assumption at the beginning that I would think that the vast majority of us in here this morning, or this afternoon rather, uh, would hold to a historic and an orthodox traditional view of sexuality, namely that God's design is for a man and a woman within the confines of a marriage, that all sexual activity is to be expressed and embodied in that union. And so that's the understanding that I'll be building off of. And so our goal today is to understand the landscape a little bit, to make a few comments on what the Bible has to say about this issue, but I would really like to spend the majority of our time talking about how do we equip our people, and in many ways, how can we be personally equipped uh, for wise and compassionate ministry to those who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Mark Yarhouse, uh, a professor at Regent University, says this, and it's a good brief word of caution. He says, teaching alone is not a replacement for personal relational ministry to people. Teaching can provide an important framework for a discussion, but it is not sufficient to address the struggles of individual young people today. And so today in the seminar, you'll probably come away with a lot of information, but that information without application is not going to lead to transformation, right? You actually have to go out and build relationships with people who are lesbian or gay or who struggle with same-sex attraction. Otherwise, a lot of the information today uh, will simply be theory. Over the past decade, there has been a very significant shift amongst evangelicals on the issue of homosexuality. In 2015, Ed Stetzer was famously quoted saying, quote, well-known evangelicals who have shifted on same-sex marriage he says you could fit them all in an SUV. He says if you do shift, you become a media celebrity, but the shift among practicing evangelicals is minimal, right? Oh, how three years has changed the landscape of that statement, right? Ed probably needs more than just an SUV. He probably needs a semi-truck probably to include the amount of people who have shifted on this important topic. A well-known pastor in the Chicago area, after the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage on June 26, 2015, commented, he said, just because it's legal, though, does not make it ethical and does not mean that it's biblical. Just because it's legal doesn't mean that it is ethical and it doesn't mean that it's biblical. Adam Barr and Ron Sitlow write this. They say, for the last three decades, evangelicals have tried to stand against the tide we have tried to turn it back and, quote, take back our country. It is time to realize something. That ship has sailed. The question is no longer can we win the culture wars. Rather, it is how can we be a compassionate, uncompromising witness in a culture that celebrates what the Bible censors, right? And so with that, we think about, well, what does the Bible have to say about homosexuality? 
right? More often than not, critics of the traditional view would say, listen, you guys are, are, are singling out six to seven extremely obscure texts about homosexuality, and you're twisting them, you're, you're making them say something that they were never intended to. Notable evangelical women speaker and author Jen Hatmaker said recently, quote, Thousands of churches and millions of Christ followers have faithfully read the scriptures, and with thoughtful and academic work, they come to different conclusions on homosexuality and countless others. Godly, respectable leader, leaders have exegeted the Bible, and there's absolutely not unanimity on its interpretation, and there never has been. Luke Timothy Johnson, who is a New Testament professor at Emory University, is perhaps, I would say, even more honest about what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. Listen to what he says, quote, he says, I have little patience with efforts to make Scripture say something other than what it says through appeals to linguistic or cultural subtleties. The exegetical situation is straightforward. We know what the text says, but what are we to do with what the text says? He says, I think it's important to state clearly that we do, in fact, reject the straightforward commands of Scripture, and we appeal instead to another authority when we declare that same-sex unions can be holy and good. What exactly is that authority? We appeal explicitly to the weight of our own experience and the experience thousands of others have witnessed to, which tells us that to claim our own sexual orientation is, in fact, to accept the way in which God has created us. By so doing, we explicitly reject as well the premises of the scriptural statements condemning homosexuality, namely that it is a vice freely chosen, a symptom of human corruption and disobedience to God's created order. Right? This is Luke Johnson. He's a New Testament professor, but I would say in so many ways, he's probably more honest than someone like Jen Hatmaker. Right? He says, listen, I don't have time for people trying to say, well, if you understood the first century culture that Paul was in, you would have understood that he didn't understand what same-sex orientation was, et cetera, et cetera. Johnson says, listen, we know what Scripture has to say, but we don't want to do it. We just need to reject Scripture. And in rejecting Scripture, we actually appeal to a higher authority. And Johnson says, listen, you know what that higher authority is? It's me. It's my own experience. That is the experience that we appeal to. When we look at the weight of Scripture, then, as we look at the texts that uh, relate to homosexuality, the critics are right. There are only seven texts that explicitly uh, talk about homosexuality. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to one that I want to read and share a few principles with you from, and that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through all the passages. If you are interested in each of those unique passages and the arguments uh, included there against homosexuality, I would include, I would commend to you uh, Kevin DeYoung's very helpful book, What Does the Bible Say About Homosexuality, where he deals in each chapter with each of those texts. Listen to what Paul has to say. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. But you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. As I think about homosexuality and what the Bible has to say about homosexuality, there's three principles that in counseling and in personal relationship that have oriented me and have been incredibly helpful as I think through what the Bible has to say. The first principle is this, is homosexual sin is serious. It is incredibly serious. Paul says at the beginning of verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will what? That they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Friends, this is a matter of eternal importance. It is an incredibly serious issue. Number two, though, and we must say this, homosexual sin, though, is not unique. It's not unique, right? Paul says, such what? Such were some of you. And he says, listen, here's what some of you were, right? You were sexually immoral. You were thieves. You were greedy. You were drunkards. You were revilers. You were swindlers. And there were people who practiced homosexuality, right? Meaning, listen, it is a sin, but it's also within a list of a lot of other things that some of you were. Is it serious? Absolutely. Is it unique? 
Not at all. Thirdly, homosexual sin is not inescapable. It's not inescapable. Listen to the note of hopefulness that Paul resounds at the end of verse 11. He says, but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, right? Homosexual sin is serious. It's not unique. And friends, this message that we need to proclaim, it is not inescapable. And that triad, that orienting triad for me in relationships and in counseling has been incredibly helpful as I've sought to minister to those who struggle with same-sex attraction and who identify as gay or lesbian. I think that the full weight of Scripture, the plain reading of Scripture, clearly points to the fact that homosexuality is not a part of God's original intended design for us. And as Christ himself says in John 10, 35, Scripture cannot be broken. Scripture cannot be broken to fit what your own experience or whatever authority that you want to appeal to makes it out to be. But I would say that's only one side of the coin. I think ministerially, oftentimes we talk about what the Bible has to say against homosexuality, and we miss an opportunity to say positively what the Bible has to say, though, about sex and about relationships. And the storyline of the Bible, I think, gives us a little bit of a roadmap to say, listen, not only is this what is prohibited, this is what is proclaimed, and this is what is heralded. Right? We begin to see in creation that every person was created as an image bearer of the triune God. Every single human being that you and I encounter is worthy of dignity and respect and consideration. Uh, the great John Calvin wrote in his Institutes, he says, we must be sure not to dwell on the wickedness of men, but rather to consider the image of God in them. That image concealing and obliterating their shortcomings entices us by its beauty and by its dignity to love and to welcome them, right? In Scripture, from the very beginning pages, we begin to realize that your primary purpose in life is not sexual expression, it's not sexual freedom, it is not self-authenticity, but your primary purpose in life, friends, is to live a life for the glory of God. In Genesis chapter 2, as we begin to move forward, we begin to see that God's plan then for sex and for relationships is that it is to happen within the confines of a marriage union, and it's supposed to happen within the confines of a man and a woman. Todd Wilson writes, he says, put positively, all sexual activity ought to express and embody the one flesh union that we call marriage. For this is the God-given purpose of sex. Put negatively, any form of sexual activity that fails to express or embody a one flesh union is out of step with the teaching of Scripture and outside the will of God. As we flash, flash forward to the Gospels and then we see Jesus Christ on the scene in the Gospels, one of the big arguments, right, against homosexuality is they say, well, listen, Jesus never talked about it. Jesus was completely silent about homosexuality, therefore it must be okay. But obviously, just because Jesus is silent on an issue does not in and of itself mean that he has nothing to say about it. In fact, quite the contrary. Preston Sprinkle writes, he says, when it comes to same-sex relations, there is nothing explicit nor implicit suggesting that Jesus corrected, improved upon, or did away with the sexual commands in Leviticus 18 and 20. Nothing. There's no evidence. And friends, as you go throughout the New Testament, whether it be in Matthew 5, 28, in Matthew 19, in Mark 10, or in Luke 16, every spot in the Gospels where Jesus talks about marriage, every time he talks about sex, you know what he affirms? He always affirms the old covenant ethic. He always affirms the goodness of marriage within the context of a man and a woman. The Jewish people had an implicit understanding that homosexuality is wrong. We understand that from our studies of, of Jewish uh, teaching at that time. The Jewish people understood that homosexuality was wrong. Therefore, right, Jesus did not need to explicitly condemn what they already implicitly knew was wrong. Gregory Coles writes, he says, not only does Jesus speak against sexual immorality, as Jews would have understood it, but he also reaffirms the sanctity of the marriage bond between male and female, right? The fall did not change God's designs or intentions for marriage relationships. And in fact, as we head to the New Testament, we see consistently that Jesus reaffirms and he builds upon the understanding of marriage between a man and a woman, well, with that, by way of foundation, I want to move to the, to the most significant part of our time together, and that is, well, what does it look like for us to build relationships and to speak truth in love? 
Uh, part of the difficulty that evangelicals, I would say, have in ministering effectively to gays and lesbians is that we oftentimes want to find quick and easy solutions uh, for what are more often than not complex issues, right? Uh, even in the Q&A in the past few sessions, right, a lot of times people want answers. They just want to be told how to think. Well, what do I do if my son does this? Or do I go to this gay wedding? Or what do I do? And what we more often than times want is some type of flow chart that removes all thinking from us, all ideas of relationship building, and you just tell me what I need to do. Sometimes you kind of feel like a theological gumball machine, right? You put a quarter in and, and give me an answer. But more often than not, it's, it's much more difficult than that, right? How do we build relationships? How do we actually interact with people who believe and act differently than from us? Here's the first thing that we need to remember, is we need to recognize our own tendency with the issue, right? Where are you at on the spectrum of people when it relates to or as it relates to homosexuality? Are you a person who simply judges it, condemns it, has a lot of self-righteous hatred against gays and lesbians? You maybe politicize the argument. You just want nothing to do with it. Maybe some of you in here are scared of it. You want to move away from it. You want to isolate from it. You see a gay or a lesbian in public, and, and you want to move away from them. You see them in a cashier checkout line, and you go and you find another checkout line. You don't want to talk to them. You don't want to have to interact with them. You hope you never have to talk to a gay or lesbian person in your life because you're afraid. Uh, maybe there's a small population in this room where you're tempted to embrace it and approve it, right? Maybe you hear the commands of Scripture, but you just think to yourself, this is just too hard. I want to be a loving person. I want to be an accepting person. And you were tempted to, to drift away from uh, the clear teaching and plain teaching of Scripture. Whatever your tendency is with the issue, my encouragement to us this, uh, this afternoon is that we are called to enter into those struggles. We are called to share those burdens. We're called to bring the truth and to bring the light uh, that, that Tim spoke uh, so well of this morning, to bring the light of the gospel message to bear. Secondly, we need to be careful with our language. We need to be careful with our language. Language and terminology is incredibly important, and again, I don't want anyone in here to hear me wrongly. I'm not advocating for a political correctness or an over-contextualization. I'm simply talking about being considerate and respectful in how we speak about gay people. Uh, trying to stay away from monolithic labels or stereotypes, saying things like the gay community or the gay lifestyle or uh, the homosexuals and making them out to be this monolithic group of people, right? We, more likely than not, don't want people to refer to us or to simply identify us as a part of the heterosexual community or the heterosexual lifestyle, per se. There's a lot more to you, right, than just your sexual orientation, uh, making sure that we don't participate in bullying of gays or lesbians, that we don't make fun of them, don't make unkind gestures or comments about them, don't laugh about jokes that are made at their expense. Well, recently, I was with a young man who struggles with same-sex attraction. He was 18 years old and still in the home, and one evening at dinner with his family, this young man struggles with same-sex attraction, had never spoken to his parents about it, an extended family member had recently come out as gay. And his mom looked at the table in conversation, was looking at all the kids and talking, and she, she said, I, I'm so thankful to God that none of you turned out like him. I'm so thankful to God that none of you turned out like him. And that comment immediately, immediately put the boy into a spot where he did not want to open up to his parents, where he didn't want to share because of the way that his mother had, had, had stated such a phrase. So we need to be careful with our language. Next, we also need to make sure not to be reductionistic in our approach. Don't be reductionistic in your approach. It is much more, uh, it's not simply or primarily about sex. It's not primarily about who they are romantically or physically or sexually attracted to. Uh, Sam Alberry, in his really helpful book that perhaps many of you have read, uh, in his little booklet, Is God Anti-Gay?, he makes the comment, he says, I struggle a lot more with greed than I do my same-sex attraction, right? Meaning that there's a lot of other things that make up who I am, that make up my story, my struggles, my hardships, my difficulties, more so than just this narrow vein of who I am attracted to. Rosaria Butterfield, a, a well-known former lesbian who came out and came to faith in Christ, in her autobiography, Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, listen to what she writes. She says, sexuality isn't about primarily what we do in bed. 
Sexuality encompasses a whole range of needs and demands and desires. Sexuality is more a symptom of our life's condition than a cause, more a consequence than an origin. Right? I think Butterfield there is in many ways echoing the Apostle Paul where he says, listen, this, this is more indicative, right, of an individual who does what? Who suppresses the truth of God in what? In unrighteousness, right? That there seems to be this downward trajectory that the fruit or the, the actual behavior comes out of, right? Don't be reductionistic in your approach and make it primarily about the behavior when the core is what needs to be addressed, Next, we need to uh, realize that it is uh, not okay, and we're not asking anyone in here, though, to be timid about their convictions and their beliefs, right? I wouldn't want anyone in here to, to hear me wrongly of, okay, so you're just saying love them and, you know, kind of hide your convictions under a bush and don't let them know that, uh, that you are a Christian or that you have a more traditional view of sexuality. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, the, the author of Proverbs writes in Proverbs 27, 5 through 6, he says, Better is what? Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, and the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Right? We don't want to be guilty of hidden love. I'm always reminded of uh, the great Old Testament commentator Bruce Waltke when he's describing hidden love. He says, Hidden love is like winking at a girl in the dark. It doesn't do you or her any good. Right? <laughs> I think a lot of times, some of us probably are tempted to, to be more on that end of things, of more of a hidden love. We don't want to offend. We don't want to kind of upset the apple cart. But Christ calls us to be honest about our convictions. He tells us in Ephesians 4 that part of the way that the church is built up is that we do what? That we speak truth in love. Love and truth, friends, are not mutually exclusive or incompatible virtues, right? Our culture says, if you love me, then you will what? You will accept me, right? And any truthfulness that might impinge upon my personal beliefs then is not loving and is bigoted or racist or misogynistic or whatever one might say. But Scripture actually holds both of those two things in perfect tension, that we can speak truth in love and that it actually has a sanctifying impact on the body of Christ. Joseph Piper, not to be confused with John Piper, uh, in his very helpful book, Faith, Hope, and Love, writes this, he says, love is not synonymous with undifferentiated approval of everything the beloved person thinks and does in real life. As a corollary, love is also not synonymous with the wish of the beloved to feel good always and in every situation and for him to be spared experiencing pain or grief in all circumstances. Mere kindness, which tolerates anything except the beloved suffering, has nothing to do with real love. No lover can look on easily when he sees the one he loves preferring convenience to the good. You see what Piper is saying there? He's saying, listen, real love is not synonymous with just I approve of everything that you say and everything that you want to do and anything that might cause you discomfort or displeasure or denial, any type of sinful desire that you might have to mortify or put away. I don't want to have to talk to you about that because that might make you uncomfortable and that would be unloving. Right, Piper says, no, that's not true. That is not true love to be completely spared of suffering and difficulty or weakness or hardship. In fact, more often than not, we find that those avenues oftentimes become the best conduits of God's grace in our life. So friends, don't be timid to be honest about your convictions and your beliefs. Uh, next, uh, we need to listen to people's stories. We need to listen to people's stories. The great theologian John Frame said that effective ministry requires three things. You want to be an effective minister? Frame says you have to exegete three things. You have to exegete your world, you have to exegete yourself, and you have to exegete Scripture. And they say most of us are probably very well versed in how to exegete Scripture. You faithfully labor day in and day out in the pulpit, delivering and publicly proclaiming God's Word. And to some degree or another, you know yourself. You probably understand your difficulties, your struggles, your temptations. But that understanding the world, exegeting the world, understanding the people that inhabit and populate that world, people that are different than you, people who are gay, people who are lesbian. I feel like that, in many ways, is an opportunity that the church has missed out on. Caleb Kaltenbach writes, he says, we need to learn to think deeper about people because nobody is shallow. Nobody is shallow. Everybody is complex. As a counselor, one of my greatest joys is to listen and to hear people's stories, to listen to them, to get to know them, 
to not fill in details for them, to not imprint or map on my story onto theirs, to give people time to change and to process. Recently, I was with a group of people, and one of the individuals in the small group opened up in a very vulnerable way and said that, uh, and admitted that they struggled with same-sex attraction. And immediately, another well-meaning brother, I think, uh, quickly chimed in. He said, I know exactly what you're going through. He said, I've tried to kick a bad habit before, and it was really hard for me, right? As if, you know, giving up fried food or exercising for a week, as it were, was, was synonymous with dealing with and battling chronic same-sex attraction. We need to be careful not to simply map on our story or to jump in and to empathize when we are not allowing for the proper time for people to share their stories. One of the resources or one of the section of resources that I've included for you in the back is stories of just personal memoir and personal testimony of men and women who either struggle with same-sex attraction and are still there or people who uh, God has changed them and allowed them to be in a marriage relationship. People like Jackie Hill Perry or Rosaria Butterfield or Wesley Hill or others like them. So I'd encourage you to pick up one of those books and read them. Stories can be helpful. Next, uh, be sure to deal with biblical descriptions and models of masculinity and femininity, not cultural stereotypes. Be careful to deal with biblical prescriptions and descriptions of masculinity and femininity, not cultural stereotypes. Sam Albury writes, he says, for example, to imply that men are supposed to be into sports or fixing their own car, or that women are supposed to enjoy crafts or to suggest that they will want to, quote, talk about everything, is to deal in cultural rather than biblical ideas of how God has made us. It can actually end up overlooking many ways in which people are reflecting some of the biblical aspects of manhood and womanhood that culture overlooks. Right, Whether it be activities, whether it be emotions, whether it be hobbies or gifts or talents that we might say, well, those are more culturally, more culturally aligned with certain genders. Are we deriving that from Scripture or from culture? I know of a young man who was heavily invested in, in love drama and theater, and he was passionate. He was a part of his college drama club and was heavily involved in it for a long time. He also played sports. He was uh, very, very good at soccer, enjoyed not only the arts, but also enjoyed sports. But there was a part of the arts that just appealed to him more, that he felt gifted and talented in. As a result of that, growing up in a fairly conservative Christian environment, he had gotten teased and made fun of quite a bit. Uh, from friends both in the church and then outside the church. A lot of friends had bullied him, made fun of him, made comments of, oh, you're gay, you must be gay, etc., because you're so involved in theater. And he came and he told me, he said, I, I never thought I was gay, but so many people told me that I was that I actually began to question whether or not I was really attracted to women. Right? The cultural pressures around him, people saying, listen, this is who you are because this is the activity that you were involved in, had caused so much pressure that he was actually struggling with his own sexual orientation. My friends, if we want to talk about masculinity and femininity, we need to make sure that the examples and the models for that are derived and come from Scripture. Next, we need to give people more than just prohibitions. Give them something attractive to say yes to, The Bible says yes, I'm convinced, to a lot more things than what the Bible says no to. Galatians 5.1, Paul writes, for what? For freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Friends, if the greatest message that you have for people who are gays or lesbians is what they are not allowed to do, who they are not allowed to sleep with, who they cannot be romantically or physically attracted to, then, friends, I'm afraid that we've lost the good and the good news, right? We've lost the message of hope and the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nick Rowan, a writer at Desiring God who struggles with same-sex attraction but who's also married, writes this. He says, The most basic and the most glorious thing that I've ever said yes to is Jesus Christ. The joys of following Jesus are everlasting and they are complete and they make the temporary promises of sin seem woefully lacking, right? I'm reminded of what the psalmist says in Psalm 1611, that in your presence is what? Is fullness of what? Joy. And at your right hand are what? Pleasures forevermore. Friends, brothers, are we proclaiming that message 
Is our message of the gospel simply prohibitions of what you cannot do, or are we also rightly including within that message, listen, you are saying yes to Jesus Christ. And friends, that is the greatest message that we can give because it is within his presence that there is joy that is unceasing and never-ending. Next, we must cultivate and develop a healthy theology of singleness. Brothers, we have got to do better when it comes to talking about singles. If we are going to ask those who struggle with same-sex attraction to reject their longings for as long as the Lord wills, then you and I have to have a strong theology of singleness that does not present singleness as merely a wilderness experience or a transitional stage to marriage, right? Right, Brothers, when was the last time you highlighted a single member of your church in a positive way? When was the last time a single person held a position of leadership or a position of influence? When was the last time you used them anecdotally in a sermon to highlight them positively, not to put them into a weird kind of group that just meets on Thursday nights and is a little bit of an oddity amongst your church body life? Are they a vibrant part of your church? Are they integral to your church? Andreas Kostenberger writes, he says, listen, singleness is actually the trajectory of the storyline of Scripture. Kostenberger says, listen, singleness at creation, it's non-existent. You only have Adam and Eve. Singleness in the Old Testament, it's uncommon and it's undesirable. If you were single and didn't marry, you had no hope of future anything, right? It just ended with you. Singleness in the New Testament, though, Jesus and Paul, they actually highlight it. Right? They actually say singleness can be advantageous for ministry and that if you can be single and remain single, you ought to do so. And then in consummation, Kostenberger notes, we are single for eternity, right? Brothers, singleness is actually highlighted positively throughout Scripture. But are we paying attention to that? Are we paying attention to the fact that our Savior, Jesus Christ, was what? He was single, right? If sexual expression or the experience of sexuality was integral and primary to what it means to be a human being, then what do we do with Jesus Christ, right? So when we talk about singles, how are we talking about them? Are we holding them out as something that is more than just a byline in a sermon or a casual joke of their expense, or are we highlighting them as integral members of the body of Christ? Peter Hubbard, in his very helpful book, Love and Delight, says this, quote, single Christians living in purity and community are billboards for the sufficiency of Jesus. Amen? Sam Albury writes this. He says, if marriage shows us the shape of the gospel, singleness shows us its sufficiency. It's a way of declaring to a world obsessed with sexual and romantic intimacy that these things are not ultimate and that in Christ we possess what is. He goes on later to write, he says, listen, people, they can live without sex. That might be a radical thought for many people in our culture today, right? People can live without sex, Albury says, but they can't live without intimacy. People can live without sex, but they cannot live without intimacy. You and I were designed and created for what? For intimacy, for relationships, for community. That's why the next point is this, is that we have got to cultivate biblical friendships. The church needs to be a place where friendship thrives and flourishes. Brad Hambrick writes, he says, in the absence of relationship, our theology becomes what? It becomes theory, right? If your only understanding of gays and lesbians is what you take away in a 45-minute session here, you don't really have anything. You probably have enough to be dangerous, right? In order to really move towards people, we have to take this theology that's simply theory, and we actually have to incarnate it in biblical friendships and relationships, Rosaria Butterfield, in her autobiography, talks about how she came to faith in Christ, and if you've read it, you understand the beauty of her story. It was through the hospitality and kindness and friendship of a local pastor in her town that ended up being integral to her coming to faith in Christ. Listen to what she said about the couple. Their names were Ken and Floyd. She says, even though obviously these Christians and I were very different, they seemed to know that I wasn't just a blank slate that I had values and opinions too. And they talked with me in a way that didn't make me feel erased. Later on in her autobiography, she has this wonderful line where she says, Ken was willing to bring the church to me. Ken was willing to bring the church to me, right? We, we of course, want people who struggle with same-sex attraction, gays and lesbians, to come to our church. We want to be a place where they can hear the message proclaimed. But I find more often than not that before they ever step through the doors of your church, 
it would be helpful if they could step through the doors of your house. If you could invite them in, if you could talk to them, if you could stop them in your local supermarket or at your child's school and you have a conversation with them. Later on, Rosaria notes in her book, she says, here's what was so, so profoundly, so profoundly unique to me. And this was the line. She says, Ken and Floyd, I was impressed by how profoundly unselfish they were. I was impacted by how unselfish they were, how, how loving they were. She goes, that was something I'd never experienced in the lesbian community. Friends, are we cultivating relationships? Are we cultivating biblical friendships with those who are different from us? Next, uh, we need to strive for relational credibility. We need to strive for relational credibility. Brothers, does our message match the life that we live? Right? We preach a message of the gospel, but is that the message that we live out? We preach a message that we want to love God and love other people, but do we just want to love heterosexual people? Or do we want to love everyone? Do we want to love our neighbors? From Matthew 5, 16 to John 13 to Romans 12, the dominating command of Scripture, the new ethic, the new commandment that Christ gives to us is what? Love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you hold to a traditional view of sexuality. No. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you what? That you have love for one another. Paul will later write in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he's admonishing the Thessalonians to work and to live in a way that matches the gospel, right? He says, listen, you don't want the message that you're proclaiming on a Sunday to be different than that what you're living on a Monday through Saturday. Does our mass message match our life? Finally, our final point is this. Friends, there is always hope. There is always hope for true change. Remember, the primary message of the gospel is not, are you heterosexual, right? Tim Keller, I think, has put it in a very memorable way. He says, heterosexuality no more gets you into heaven than homosexuality will send you to hell. Heterosexuality will no more get you into heaven than homosexuality will send you to hell. Remember, friends, the goal of the gospel is not heterosexuality. It's holiness, right? That's the goal of the gospel. Holiness, which comes from an authentic, real, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul writes of this relationship in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Again, 1 Corinthians six eleven. Such were some of you, but you have been washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, right? The sanctification process, does it impact our sexuality? Absolutely, but it impacts a whole lot of other things too. It does something about our lust. It does something about our impatience. It does something with our anger. It does something with how we bear up under suffering. It does something with how we deal with frustration in our children and a whole variety of other issues, not just our sexuality. Sam Albury writes, he says, I believe that change is possible but a complete change of sexual orientation is never promised in the Bible. And I think that we have to be mindful and cognizant of that. When we see change in the Gospels, when we see change in the New Testament, a, a wholesale change in one's sexual orientation is never promised, right? It's talked about in a very big picture scale of, listen, you were washed, you were sanctified, and it has practical implications on day-to-day -day life, but a wholesale promise that you will go from homosexuality to a heterosexual inclination is nowhere promised in Scripture. People from a variety of backgrounds have found different paths, whether it be celibacy and singleness, to some people do experience true change at the orientation level to heterosexual. Other people remain in mixed orientation marriages where they're married and they're sexually and romantically attracted to their spouse of an opposite gender, but at times they continue to struggle with same-sex attraction. There are many different options for committed believers who want to seek and to follow Christ and to live faithfully to his commands. Wesley Hill writes, he says, the message of what God has done through Christ reminds me that all Christians, whatever their sexual orientation, to one degree or another, experience the same frustration that I do as God challenges, threatens, endangers, and transforms all our natural desires and affections. And friends, that's the message that I want to convey to, to my friends who are gay or lesbian or who struggle with same-sex attraction. Listen, the same gospel that you need is the same gospel message that I need. The same way that God changes people, that he changes me, is going to be the same way that he changes you. That at the end of the day, I am probably much more like you than I am different. I'm much more like you than I am different. 
With all that being said, we're going to take a pause now, and uh, we have about 20 minutes uh, for question and answer, and I think we have uh, several helpers uh, that have microphones. Uh, because we are being live streamed, we are going to try and do this as smoothly as possible, and so we're going to actually just move uh, from one side of the auditorium to the next, and uh, within 20 minutes, we'll seek to answer as many questions as we're able to. Uh, if you could keep your question to actually being a question, uh, that would be helpful, and uh, we'll try to get as much done as we can. I'll restate the question and uh, for everyone's benefit. So we'll start right over here, right there in the back. Uh, what kind of resources or where could we look for families in our church who have a son or daughter who have turned to an alternate lifestyle? Great question. In the back of your handout, I've included, uh, I, I think, probably over 100 different resources that could be helpful for you. And again, I would encourage you, some of them I've tried to put into different categories of what could be helpful, uh, whether it be personal account and memoir, whether they be many books that you could just quickly read probably in 5 to 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, on the online resources and sites, there's a number of different online locations. Uh, livingout.org is a ministry based in the UK. Uh, that's been incredibly helpful for me. It's a bunch of different videos of people sharing their testimonies, their stories about living faithfully uh, with same-sex attraction. Uh, there's a number of other different resources, uh, counseling ministries, other places like that that can be helpful uh, as you navigate some of those conversations. So I'd encourage you to take advantage of some of those. I think my contact information is also there uh, behind me. If you have questions about some more specific resources, uh, email me. Uh, I'd love to follow up as this helpful. Any other questions maybe from this section right up here in the front? Just wait to get the mic. I've recently started hearing a lot more about conversion therapy and the, the laws and the, the challenges against that. Can you speak to anything on, on where that is? is right. How's that playing out um, with all the legalities right now? Right. The question was about, can we make a comment about conversion therapies? And uh, conversion therapy, I would say, is not biblical. Conversion therapy uh, has its roots in psychology, secular psychology, and it does not see homosexuality as a sin, but it sees homosexuality as maladaptive or as a disorder. So in conversion therapy, if somebody comes in and they express that they're gay or lesbian, they're counseled to not embrace that side of them, not because it's not biblically right, but because they would consider it to be maladaptive or a mental health disorder. So then you go through conversion therapy. They do a lot of different works on uh, relationships, external relationships. Did you have poor relationships with a family member? Were you abused, et cetera? And so in, in many ways, uh, uh, some people within the Christian community took conversion therapy, kind of Christianized it, and we've probably all heard statements like pray the gay away or, you know, God will take those gay feelings away or some iteration of that. Its roots, conversion therapy's roots, though, are rooted in secular psychology. They would not see it as a sin, but it's maladaptive and must be treated as such. And so then the goal for conversion therapy is heterosexuality, not godliness, not holiness, not some other type of biblical ethic or goal. And so when people talk to me about conversion therapy or if they've been a part of conversion therapy, uh, I think a lot of times we've got to do a lot of work to help them even come out of what typically is a pretty uh, traumatic experience, a pretty traumatic counseling experience, and try to reframe that biblically. But excellent question. Any other questions on this side? Maybe move a little bit over here. Any questions? I think we got a question right over here. Okay, this is in my face. Um, you said something about some of us may be afraid. I'm fearful, but not of them, but of me. Hmm. I pastor a small church, and um, recently, a woman who has brought her children to our children's ministry every week has had an affair with a local Episcopal priest who was a woman, okay. and now has been defrocked, and now they show up at our church on Wednesday nights together. Hmm. And I try and find another door to go through because hmm. I'm afraid of what I'll say. Yeah. You said in your notes that we are commanded to enter into this. Help me do that. Right. Well, first, can I say, it's a great question. What do you do? I think what the gentleman is expressing is he, he is fearful. What does he do with this situation? 
woman at his church involved in a relationship with a defrocked Episcopalian female priest who now is attending on a Wednesday evening. What do I do with that? Thank you for being honest about that, that you are fearful. And I think that's, that's probably the first step is acknowledging, hey, every conversation is not easy and I don't have an answer to every single situation. Uh, you know, in a, in a situation like this, friend, I think I would, I would want to try to break that barrier. The, the ethical commands in Scripture, right, Christ gives us in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, Matthew 6, he says, here's the threshold. Uh, pray for those who persecute you and bless your enemies, right? It seems that like even people who are willfully doing your harm, doing you harm, there's a way that we can actually still be Christ-like towards them. There's still a way that we can love and move towards. We can pray for them. We can bless them. So what do we do with these two women who are coming through your doors at church? What does effective ministry look like? Well, in one ways, I would think it would look like ministry to everybody else at your church. How do I seek to faithfully pastor them? Uh, when they're living in sin, how do I hold out the promises and the joys of holiness and cruciform living to them? Uh, when I can get to know them, when I can share a meal with them, when I can ask questions, when I can enter into their story, I want to do that. Uh, how does that conversation start? That was asked in another one of the breakouts. Well, how do I even start that conversation? It's simple. It's how you'd start off any other one. Hi, my name is. How are you doing? Tell me a little bit about yourself. One of my counseling mentors, Ed Welch, says one of the questions that can always get you mileage in a conversation if you don't know what to say is, tell me more. Tell me more. That's really interesting. You mentioned that. Well, why do you do that? Or tell me a little bit about your background. I find that to be really fascinating in expressing genuine interest. Again, uh, for, for many people, their stereotypical understanding of Christians might be fairly negative, that you're bigoted, that you're uh, judgmental, that you're self-righteous. So just like we don't want to stereotype them, we don't want them to stereotype us. So any way that we can move towards them. And again, do you have to then endorse their lifestyle? Absolutely not. I don't want anyone in here to wrongly hear that I'm trying to ask you to compromise principles. It's our culture that says, if you love me, then you will accept me, and those are mutually exclusive. I think that we can hold firm to our convictions, but do it without compromising and do it in compassion. So thanks for that question. Moving a little bit over here, we got somebody over here in the blue. Thank you for your very biblical and uh, very warm and uh, uh, good comments. Thank you. As, um, as I'm from Seattle, and as I um, live in a very, very um, f gay, lesbian, fluent area, um, and see the, also the gender issues that are coming up with people not knowing. Uh, I recently heard a video of a man uh, talking about how he had become a woman and then now he's realized that he did not have, he was not a um, transgender, but that he had gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe if you could comment on that, I, I, I thought it was very interesting the way he came across. and. Right. You know, transgender uh, issues are definitely at the forefront of the conversation. And again, if we're a little bit behind the eight ball as a church on uh, issues related to gays and lesbians, I think we're definitely behind the eight ball on issues related to gender. Uh, Alistair frequently says, you know, the church seeks to marry the spirit of the age and finds itself a widow in the next, right? We're constantly trying to keep up and find ways that we can actually kind of catch up to culture, have culture accept us. And by the time we get there, culture has gone two more steps ahead of us. And, you know, we're kind of uh, twiddling our fingers. What do we do here? An issue with gender dysphoria, what you describe, I would definitely agree with you. It's much more in vogue. Uh, I find more and more often, especially in counseling and in people that are seeking referrals for counseling, you know, what do I do with my five-year-old? He's playing with dolls, and, you know, does he, does he really, is he really a female, and, you know, what do we need to do? Questions like that are becoming more and more common. I would say experientially and anecdotally, and then also research seems to bear out that a lot of those cases, especially in childhood and adolescence, a lot of them uh, get resolved in terms of that gender dysphoria. And for any of you who don't understand what gender dysphoria is, gender dysphoria is the feeling that you are different than your embodied or your given gender at birth. So you were born female, but you identify more as female, and the mix between those two things is called gender dysphoria. So again, many people are coming forward and saying that they struggle with that. So again, what does effective ministry look like that? you know, for people. And I would say a lot of the principles that we talked about here 
I think, uh, become immediately applicable to people uh, who struggle with gender dysphoria. One of the unique things I will comment about gender identity issues, different than sexual identity issues, is that at, at the core, the homosexual community actually communicates existentially a very different narrative than what people who struggle in the transgender community. Uh, people who are gay, lesbian, or bisexual say, my sexual orientation is fixed. This is who I am. God made me this way, right? I've always been this way. I was born this way. The transgender community actually says the opposite, right? They say anatomy is not destiny. Yeah, I was born male, but you can't tell me I'm a male. My body doesn't tell me I'm a male. Culture doesn't tell me I'm a male. I'm a female. I can be whoever I want. It's much more fluid, which I think in many ways explains that the transgender community has been so isolated from the alphabet soup acronym of you know LGBTQQIA or whatever it might be because they are fundamentally actually saying completely different narratives. One is saying, this is who I am, accept me. The other people over here are saying, you can't tell me who I am, my sexuality is fluid, I can be whoever I want to be. So with gender dysphoria, one of the inroads that I, th I, I seek to make in counseling with people who struggle with that is a Christian understanding of identity. And I think that the Bible has the best things to say about identity, an identity that is much more stable, much more durable, and much more sane than my feelings, than what culture tells me I am or what I am not. And I actually find that most people who are struggling with gender dysphoria, they're actually really hungry for something like that. Uh, they are hungry for something that is stable and secure and durable and sane in the midst of their own personal feelings and whatever emotions might be afflicting them. So, great question. Moving over to this side, we got one right right up here up front. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask you two questions, it's okay with you. Yep. Uh, where I met in California, I came across two women who were married legally. They adopted children, and then one of them started to realize the way she was raised, she needed the Bible, and now they're stuck in this, what do we do with the kids yes. if she's going to follow Christ? So, what would be your advice for that? And the second is, uh, I don't know about Ohio, but the other thing we have there is pansexual, yes. where it's a free-for-all. Yes. And a lot of the teenage girls are, including my daughter's friends, are all claiming to be pansexual. Right. And when they come to the house, they want to talk to her about it constantly. Right. And when you break it down, it's literally animals, plants, spirits. Mm -hmm. It's anything will fly. Right. So right. what would be your advice on that? On the first comment about a, a lesbian couple, adopted children, one starts reading the Bible, uh, making an assumption maybe they, they want to live a life of faithfulness, fidelity to Christ. They, they are beginning to, to, to have those, those, uh, those thoughts and those desires. What do we do? That's a complex issue, and I don't have a, a simple answer to it. I do remember in, in, in an analogous situation uh, in my own experience that, that one of the things that we came to is, well, in your context, what would it look like for you right now to live faithfully to the gospel? And one of the things for them, they both had two daughters that were about to graduate from high school that they had adopted. It, it did mean uh, not having sexual intercourse. And that was one way, obviously upset. They're actually now divorced. Uh, but that was one of the things. You didn't move out of the house. They were obviously able to do that financially. But one, one act of her faith, one act and move of sanctification was well, here's one way that impacts me. Well, fundamentally impacts my sexuality. Uh, it's a, definitely a complex issue, though. I'll say that when children are involved. So I would say a lot of counsel, and, and I wouldn't want to make a decision in isolation. Your second question about pansexual, right, that's, that's all over the news. A, a well-known uh, music and movie star recently came out in Billboard magazine and, and reported that she was pansexual, and uh, hits on Google skyrocketed of what is pansexual, and I think you described it accurately. It's pan, meaning all. She's attracted to anything. You know, Jamie Smith, many of you have read uh, James K. Smith's uh, cultural liturgies, uh, uh, Triad, Desiring the Kingdom, You Are What You Love, uh, one of my favorite authors. Jamie, you know, makes a comment about culture, and he says culture slowly is collapsing in on itself, really into absurdity. I mean, you can, you can only continue to move so far to the point now, of, okay, I'm sexually attracted to everything and anything, that it seems that culture just continues to grasp and grasp at the most absurd, the most unrealistic. 
And so he says, man, the message then is what is stable, what is true, and what is true is what we see revealed in God's word, what is stable. Sooner or later, I will say this, there's something about sexual identity, gender identity, wherever you're at, somewhere along the lines, if you completely go down that path of I can just do whatever I want, be whoever I want, you bump into problems, right? Sooner or later, though, my sexuality is gonna bump up into, into concerns that you might have, right? I might say, I think it's okay for me to have sex with somebody who's a minor. Well, that's illegal. Well, why is that illegal, right? Well, why is that wrong? Well, you can't, you can't limit who I am. You can't limit what I want to do. This is what makes me me, right? This is the Charles Taylor. We live in the age of authenticity. I think culture is only going to be able to continue on this path for so long before it collapses in on itself in terms of just pure absurdity in terms of what it can and can't handle. So when that identity crumbles, you know what I want left to be standing? The church as a witness of the gospel. And I think that's what's so important for us to remember is that we have to stay true and hold true to what is right, hold fast to what is good, and then trust the result to God. I think we have time for a few more questions, maybe something over here. Oh, do we have somebody with the microphone? Noah, right back there, thanks. Um, there is a one part in the scripture that talks about Jonathan and uh, David, and that David had love for Jonathan more than a woman. How might that how might you use that in counseling or how do you look at that from a biblical perspective too? Right, excellent question about the passage uh, d between David and Jonathan. Their friendship is heralded throughout scripture and really in classical literature as almost the archetypal male friendship. I wrote a book on friendship and so it's deeply important to me and, and David and Jonathan is not the only friendship in scripture but it's an important one. I do think it's, it's incredibly helpful when we're talking about just the, the depth of what friendship can offer to us. Uh, Proverbs says that there's a friend who sticks closer than a what? Than a brother. And in a culture where biology and family connection was everything, I mean, it was the key to success, to be able to say that there can be somebody that's non-biologically related to you that is better than that, that would have been completely, that would have been completely shocking to, uh, to, to those hearers and to that culture. So the friendship of Jonathan and David, I think, shows us the primacy of the gospel. It shows us the primacy of Christ, really, because you look at David and Jonathan, and functionally, there's really nothing that should have drawn them together. One is royalty, the other one's a shepherd. They should not have encountered each other. They came from completely different backgrounds, completely different castes, completely different walks of life. But what is there a commitment to? There's a commitment to live out Hesed love, this steadfast, faithful love that I think in many ways points forward to the love that Christ has for us. So when we get to John 15, he says, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you what? I call you friends. And that there's something about friendship that, you know, in the words of Michael W. Smith, you know, friends are friends forever, right? Friendship is the relationship that has started at creation and continues throughout eternity. Uh, so when we're talking about people who struggle with same-sex attraction or who are struggling uh, in singleness and not same-sex attracted for that matter, I think that biblical friendships are, are something that we need to be talking about, modeling, uh, and, and just in many ways raising the profile of. Again, the church for good reason has talked a lot about marriage and family, but the relationship of friendship I think has been something that uh, we've not discussed enough. So you think about Paul and Luke or Ruth and Naomi. Uh, I mean, there's, there are examples throughout scripture of these wonderful bonds between, uh, between people uh, that are gospel-centered and that are propelled to, to, to promote that message. So friendship, I think, is incredibly important. I'd, I'd recommend my book as a resource on that topic, and then also uh, there's another uh, book here by a guy named Brad Hambrick called Do Ask, Do Tell, and he talks about what does it look like uh, to build friendships uh, for the gospel. So that's an excellent resource. I think it's 329. We probably have time for one more question before we need to wrap things up right over here. What do we do with our members that are asking how they should handle invitations to weddings and um, putting money in cards to help support right. gift giving and stuff? Great question. What do we do with members who are asking about what do I do with weddings, putting money in cards, etc.? Again, my, my simple answer would be I think you have to do with that on a case-by-case -case basis and in a way that is in keeping with their conscience. Uh, Romans 14, 23, Paul says, what is not done from faith is sin. So for some people in good conscience, they cannot go to a, a wedding that a same-sex partnership is being uh, celebrated. Uh, other people, I think conscience-wise, are able to do that. 
uh, one of the questions I would ask is to what degree are you connected to this couple? Are they a direct family member or are they your next door neighbor's coworkers, aunt? You know, I mean, one would probably inform me a bit differently as to would I attend their wedding or would I not attend? Uh, but that is a question I think uh, that necessitates and needs godly counsel that we probably need to ask some other pre-questions uh, before we ask that question of do I go to that wedding. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I'm going to close this in prayer and then I can be available for questions afterwards, but thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, Father, we come to you uh, this afternoon and I thank you for these men who are endeavoring and seeking to be faithful pastors in their weakness and in uh, in a variety of contexts and locations. Lord, I pray that you would uh, equip them and encourage them through your word, Father, to have uh, hope and strength uh, of conviction uh, and to do that compassionately and wisely and winsomely. And we ask all this in Christ's name, amen.